um, I, th I think I don't need this uh, device. No, it, it's okay. Um, yeah, as so many invited speakers of us, uh, it's the first time in Brazil for me, and I'm very glad, grateful that you invited me to this series of conferences just to get a better knowledge of this country than uh, the airport at uh, Sao Paulo. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my topic, and uh, I will speak about these two guys, uh, René Descartes and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Um, first of all, my thesis, so this is a short uh, summary of what's going on. Um, early modern rationalism is usually regarded or characterized as seeking access to all possible knowledge about the world, the world regarded as a conceptual structure with the help of a mathematical model. <laughs> Given the set of all elementary concepts, all possible complex concepts, and with this all possible knowledge can be derived by calculation or uh, other deductive methods. On the other hand, even Descartes and Leibniz regarded this program as uh, a utopian program, although it's logically possible. So the reality is okay, but it's utopian. And this led to the development of methodological means for handling complexity and minimizing mistakes induced by the limitations of human beings. Um, I will start with uh, the postmodern critique to uh, Descartes and uh, the, De the Cartesian program. There's a consensus among historians of philosophy that the philosophy of the modern age um, is closely connected to Descartes. This is true already for Hegel, who said um, that, the new, that the philosophy of the new world started with Descartes. And it still today, for historians like Wolfgang Wild, who said that modern philosophy starts with Descartes in the 17th century, so it's the same sentence. The consensus is not that uniform in respect to the reasons. Wolfgang Welch, for example, states in his bestseller on, his, uh, on our postmodern uh, modernity that for us today exact science, uh, Mathesis Universalis, systematic mastership of the world, the scientific technological civilization, that is the line leading to us, has its beginnings with Descartes. Welch refers to Husserl uh, from his crisis uh, book, where Husserl wrote, and this is uh, a typical Husserl translated into English, which becomes a typical English Husserl, which is hard to understand. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's easier to read German philosophers in English translation, but I fear that <laughs> it makes no sense. <laughs> um, well, Husserl writes in his Crisis uh, uh, book that when uh, when they, they, uh, what do do I? Uh, Descartes formed a completely new idea, and this is the quote, that the infinite allness of what is being at all is as such a rational aloneness that can be governed, and in fact completely governed, by a universal science. So universality as uh, a key concept in Descartes' philosophy. To make it short, following again, uh, again Welsh, Descartes is a symbol for the philosophy of the modern age, he stands for a radical relaunch and for the claim of universality. These two characteristic features are, according to Welch, obviously of technical spirit, driven by a pathos and desire of structuring, trimming, knowing no interior or exterior limits. They remind us of the fundamental technical characteristics of the modern age, which we understand as the epoch of a scientific technical world. This strife for universal validity, certain knowledge, and uniform method became the target of criticism after the growing complexity of the world and the limits of our possible knowledge had been realized. The big story of the emancipation of man in the Enlightenment was declared as finished, as 
he was hurt, did. Fundamental reasoning was replaced by weak reasoning, by Watimu, for example. The aspire for certainty, according to the model of mathematics, was regarded as logocentristic, Derrida. The desire for unity and universality was opposed by the emphasis of breaks, by uh, Foucault, for example, or uh, the emphasis, emphasis on, on difference, like in Derrida. Keith De Devlin's concept of the soft mathematics, um, and in his book on Descartes' error, he, he, he announced the end of logic, can also be named in this context. Soft mathematics is understood as a toolbox for the formulation of a new cosmology of the mind, but not subject uh, of the usual criteria for mathematical rigidity. Thus, both characteristic features of rationalism are criticized, the strife for unity with the claim of universality and the orientation towards exact methods. In what follows, I would like now to show that, in a sense, Descartes and uh, Leibniz were postmodernists <laughs> as well. <laughs> but on the other hand, they had this, um, this heuristic aim to, to reach this universal science. So it's uh, very positive, or optimistic in their program, but they knew that they never will reach it. Um, I will start with an example from uh, his Principia uh, Philosoph uh, Philosophiae, Principia Philosophiae, um, a French edition of this, or French translation of this book, appeared 6047, and uh, Descartes added a letter to the translator, Picot, and uh, these are some of his arguments there. Descartes reports, uh, reports on his earlier writings, that is, uh, the treatise on method and the meditations, um, he said that in these methodological writings, he started to uh, explain all of philosophy, and philosophy means uh, everything, so everything which can be known, so including physics and including mathematics. In order to complete this project, he would have to explain in the same way the nature of every single body existent on the earth. So this is what he said in the Pencipia, so it's st the starting in the methodological, methodological work, but uh, to complete it, you have to explain everything, and every single object in the world. With this, he would give mankind the complete system of philosophy, the true philosophy, which means everything which can be known. He would dare to, well, he is very optimistic, so he said, I dare to do this. So I, he can execute this task, because he does not yet feel too bold to complete such a project. He is not skeptical concerning his necessary powers and he feels not too distant uh, to what is still missing. But he needs, as he says, the opportunity to do all the experiments to justify and support his reasons. And then he says that he, as a private being, as a private citizen, needs the support of the broader society. He cannot expect it, and therefore he will not do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a sense, true philosophy is possible, but it cannot be finished in practice, at least not for people like Descartes as a private man. Another, another uh, example, this is from a famous exchange between uh, Descartes and Merzen. Merzen informed Descartes 1629 about a long matrice, a mother language, which has been, had been invented by a certain valet, <coughs> and this uh, long matrice uh, allowed, or was designed to allow, to understand all languages, every single language. Uh, I refer now to Descartes' letter to Merzen, his, his uh, uh, responding letter from the 20th of November 1629. There in this letter, Descartes discusses standard stuff, so universal languages was a, was a topic at the time, and. Uh, what he said was not very original. So he says, uh, well, there are advantages, advantages and there are problems of pasigraphies, that is, general scripts of polygraphies, that is, scripts for more than one language, for several languages, or steganographies, that is, secret languages. He gives some features of such languages. Uh, the grammar has to be simple and regular. You need a complete set of simple, of the elementary concepts. So this has to be set up. Um, then you can 
assign a number to these concepts. These numbers serve then as a key for correlating synonyms of other languages. So we have the one language with, that, with its simple, con uh, 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 simple concepts. You have the number system in the middle, and you have a translation to the other language. So you need, of course, dictionaries, of course, just to relate the numbers to the concepts. He says something about the features of elementary concepts. They have to be ordered like ideas and thoughts in order to commemorate them easier. The, his tip is just to, or his suggestion is just to um, use the analogy of, of number theory, of numbers, because these numbers have not, have not to be learned one by one. They can be lined up. They can be constructed. The creation of universal language depends, therefore, on the creation of a true philosophy. And now his definition of true philosophy. Uh, in this true philosophy, all ideas are named and designated and all thinkable, clear, and distinct ideas can be constructed by calculation. And then he says, though, this is the best possible way to acquire a good science. So now, his resume in a sense. Now I believe, he says, however, that such a language is possible and that one can find the science it depends on, with the help of which farmers will be better, better judge about the truth than the philosophers today. But I cannot imagine how it could ever come into use. It presupposes so enormous changes in the order of things, and the whole world would have to become an earthly paradise which can be expected only in the land of fiction. So the program is there, it's possible, but it can never be reached, only in the land of fiction. So Descartes formulates the idea of a philosophical or rational language, like many people before him. This philosophical language is designed as an ideography, aiming at a completely depicting, uh, uh, aiming at completely depicting the system of human thought. It presumes the possibility of establishing the complete list of elementary ideas and the uh, corresponding elementary concepts. With the help of a matrix universalis, all true concepts can be constructed by calculation. But although such universal language and true philosophy were logically possible, it's nevertheless a practical utopia. So the universal language would provide certainty in all conceptual domains, but in practice, you have to accept answer. This is from the Nachlass of Leibniz. You find, uh, so this is not, this is Leibniz's handwriting and this is Leibniz's handwriting. And this is from a white writer who gives an excerpt of this letter of Descartes uh, to Merzen. Leibniz reports on this letter and gives a comment on it. So this is what Leibniz wrote. Even if Descartes' universal language were dependent on the true philosophy, it is not dependent on its perfection. It is possible to establish such language, even if philosophy was not good. <laughs> to the same extent as human science would develop, language would developed as well. So he was, uh, as we call it in Germany, a macher. He tries to produce these things and bring them to existence, but he knows what well, it's not really the program. It's one. When did Leibniz um, It's always a problem to, <laughs> after 16, so it's it's in the, in the end of the 17th century. Uh, um, I don't really know from where. So it's, 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 it's not dated. Um, so in a sense, start by, by, by producing such a language without having the complete system of elementary ideas. <coughs> so Leibniz organized this work according to the principle of combining theory and practice. This is uh, given in a letter to, or this is characterized in a, in a letter to the mathematician and scientist Gabriel Wagner of whom is said, well, he is famous because he got a letter by Leibniz. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this is again, still read. So this is written in German, and it's easier to understand it if you read it in English. Um, this is what he wrote. The art of practice consists in bringing, bringing even accidental facts under the yoke of science as far as it, it is expedient. This is important, as far as it is expedient 
the more this is done, the closer practice is to science. Um, so there is a demand of uh, theoretical permeation of science, as, and this is important, at least as far as it is expedient. So not everything, but everything you need for solving the problems you have. Theory and practice are closely related to each other, but they do not coincide. It is not necessary to have the theory at hands before the practice can start. Leibniz always attempted to reach theoretically optimal solutions, but he was ready to accept quick results in the form of interim solutions. These solutions are tested in practice and can, further be, and can be further developed in the course of time. The idea opens the rational permeation of science for non-rational creativity becoming the driving force for the art of invention. Art of invention means uh, to find new truths. Um, this program is characterized in, a, in another manuscript, the Logica Nova Contenda. I will um, give the essentials of this manuscript, just how to do it. <coughs> and you always see in, in Leibniz and Descartes, Descartes, it's bound to a rational theology, so you, you cannot get rid of um, the metaphysics which included God. So the, the truth in the nature of things, or truths in the nature of things, and in God's mind, are determined. So this is a determination presupposition. It is also de determined in the advance what we can infer from knowledge. Uh, we have to gain with absolute certainty or with, with highest probability. We do not err if we follow the logical rules strictly in respect to argument, and do not accept propositions whose truth or highest probability has not yet been proved in respect to the material side of things. So you have to follow logic and you have to accept only um, contents which is uh, proved or which has highest probability. We can finish then disputes by ordering the arguments in syllogistic form, including all preceding syllogisms, until we get a syllogistic proof, or it has been determined what still lacks a proof, or still has to be investigated. So this is an application of the Papian uh, method, of the regressive analysis. So you have a problem, just go to the preconditions necessary for solving the problems. You can stop as soon as you have principles, which which are accepted, or you have proven things, you have an interim solution if you can determine what are the basic problems, what problems have to be solved, just to solve your actual problem. This method of investigation allows to provide a great wealth of truth within a short time. If we succeed to show that the thesis can be derived from a proof proposition, or at least from a certain simpler proposition yet to be proved, we are deterred from taking up older controversies. But we have to argue about new questions, but have to argue about new questions that have emerged from the other ones. So do not um, repeat all discussions all the time, but find the basic problems, new problems. Um, following this method, we will get to know the answers to most questions, at least to the extent possible, given by the limitations of the human mind, and one should not forget man is not God, so there are limitations of the human mind. If you have not found a solution, uh, that a solution of a problem cannot be derived from the given, we can look for methodological experiments in order to direct the mind to other knowledge which could be relevant by analogy, something like this. If we cannot find such experiments, the mind has found its peace, like for example, in the case of the Papetum mobile. So it makes no sense to look for one, because it proves there is no one. Um, the reason for the fact of ongoing disputes and quarrels can be seen in psychological circumstances, the limitations of the human mind, but also in the imperfection of logic. This new logic should provide the independent norms for disputes. The new logic should find the investigations uh, should guide the investigations at the threat of reasoning, the filium computandi. You cannot know everything. This is impossible, so you have to know important things, the things which are necessary to prove your actual problems. And this is the filium computandi, just to 
to guide you through the infinite wealth of possible knowledge. So this is, in a sense, the, the, the presentation of for, or the, the arguments for the reason uh, or the reasons for the fact that he demands a new logic. So this is bound to a metaphysics. So and uh, one should keep them apart. So we, we have a meta metaphysical side of uh, argument, and you have some sort of practical uh, side. So the one is the human part, so human's eye view, and the other is God's eye. The limitation of factual, not possible knowledge, are due to the limits of the human being who differs from the um, omniscient God. Within the infinitely complex system of pre-established harmony, it is impossible for a finite human being to get access to all truths set into possible being in the act of creation. This is especially true due to limited access to the truth of fact, that is, contingent truth, which can be otherwise. The situation is different in the case of the truth of reason, the necessary truth, based on the principle of, principles of identity, non-contradiction, and sufficient reason. These principles with, which govern human reasoning are divine in nature. And the reason is given in this uh, next point. Even God does not act against these principles. But as the omnipotent being, he cannot be restricted by laws. Therefore, <gasps> these principles are divine, so they are features of God. In the infinite mind, in God, Truth of facts and truth of reason coincide. They are the same, but not in the human mind. The finite mind can use these divine methods, logic, mathematics, and other things, only in partial fields of possible domains of knowledge. It is an act of human creativity to determine these fields and the principles governing them. Um, Blackness stresses the dialogical character of these methods to solve disputes. The house with candy, or to solve problems, and he uses the Appian regressive analysis. It is a question of intersubjective agreement to determine the principles which may entail a deductive solution of the problem. If such a house with candy uh, is once been erected completely, I quote him, two philosophers who are in a dispute will argue not differently from two mathematicians. It will be enough that they take their pen sit down in front of their abacus and say to each other, calculimus, let's calculate. The question is, why do they sit down? Why do they simply calculate and publish a result? They have to, um, they have to, uh, to find the principles from which they calculate them. This is the equation of negotiation. Simply, first of all, you need the Fidum de Capitandi leading you to your principles, and then you can calculate and solve your problem. So, I, this is, in a sense, what I wanted to say. Now, uh, I give you some hints on methods developed by Leibniz. Only hints, and <laughs> I'll finish in a couple of minutes. Um, uh, his methods, um, just to, to, uh, yeah, to fulfill his program, or to, to go as far as possible to enlarge um, human knowledge. So, he started with his combinatorial method in uh, the only book he published, uh, the Dissertatio de Arte Combinatoria. And what you find here is um, that the square of oppositions applied to the four elements of, of Aristotle. So you, the relation of concepts uh, are given in this picture. So combinatorics as a tool, combining concepts as a tool to gain new knowledge. Uh, sorry, how can this be accomplished? What he says, what he has here, the, the, the four elements, that is frigitas, humiditas, kaliditas, sigitas, and he says this contradicts, and this is uh, coherent, this can be occur at the same time, other things exclude each other, so this is what is done there. <coughs> the relations between concepts um, are given here in this, in this just according to the, to the um, square for positions. So um, the, other, the other methods are logical calculating, that is calculating with concepts, and this is uh, the man a manuscript uh, 
um, giving plus calculus. So you have one operation, uh, and um, the, uh, in ESSA relation. So these are the two uh, important relations there. So, uh, a logical calculus which helps you to calculate this concept. The Characteristica Universal is important. It is, uh, well, he has this, um, this, this is the same project as uh, Descartes. So, have you the complete list of simple concepts? Take numbers to name these concepts. So, this is an easy thing. He has an, an arithmetic, uh, arithmetic calculus to calculate these concepts. Uh, you can use other, um, other signs. But if you take numbers, the simplest thing is to, to take binaries. So, you have only two signs, zero and one. And this is illustrated in this model. So this was designed by, by Leibniz himself in Latin and in the German version. Einer hat alles aus nichts gemacht. One has created everything from nothing. Bild der Schöpfung, the picture of the creation. Eins is not, one is enough. You see, you can, you can give a representation of all of the world by using only two signs, zero and one. And you have the calculating devices, um, just in order to relieve the mind from standard weight. So calculating is nothing for, a, for, a, for an intelligent being, so a machine should do this. And you have this is the, the calculating machine, which is stored in Hanover, the original one. And uh, this is a binary machine, so um, uh, Leibniz never built a binary calculating mach machine, but he had some sort of principle, uh, comes from the sketches, giving the principle of such a machine. And this was uh, built in Hanover uh, just as a working sample how to uh, calculate with binaries. So this is what I wanted to say. I, uh, but this is the last slide. Thank you very much. <laughs>